right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for rejoining us. I am Sarah Truhaft, a senior director at PolicyLink. For those of you who don't know our organization, we are a national research and action institute based in Oakland, California. Our mission is advancing economic and social equity. And we are gathered here today in Portland um, for those of you joining through the live stream with community advocates, researchers, and data tool creators to strategize about how we can create data tools that advance health equity through community action. I, first, I want to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for supporting this event and enabling us to be here today. And also thank our partners at Ecotrust for lending us this space and for designing this event with us. So we've been talking about the evolution of equity data tools today. When our previous panel talked about the Portland Regional Equity Atlas and its evolution, it started in 2007, so it's been 10 years since then, and then there's been a great um, proliferation of more equity data tools. These data tools really have vast potential to advance health equity action by putting powerful data in the hands of community organizers, advocates, and leaders who are working for change. So we know that your zip code plays a key role in your health and your access to economic opportunity. And we know that the unequal environments in, in which people live work, learn, and play, produce health inequities that are detrimental to those suffering from them and from, for all of us in our broader economy. And these inequities are caused by structural racism, discrimination, poverty, and the policies that are creating and delivering unequal resources and opportunities to different places. So that is why these data tools are, can be powerful by showing these inequities by showing trends in terms of where it's getting better, where it's getting worse, and then showing assets and improvements and opportunities to build upon. But data itself is not social change. Data itself is a bunch of numbers, right? Um, and so that's why we're here today with some leaders who have developed data tools that are really delivering data to community putting it in the hands of people who can advocate for change. And so let me um, introduce our panelists and then tell you about how our panel's gonna run. So first we have Sam Sinyangwe, who is the co-founder of Campaign Zero and the developer of Mapping Police Violence. And then we have Julia Sebastian, who's a research associate at Race Forward and the creator of Clocking In, the data tool. And then we have Nathaniel Smith, who is the founder and chief equity officer at Partnership for Southern Equity and the creator of the Metro Atlanta Equity Atlas. And then we have Kat Goganauer, who is the senior program manager at Prosperity Now's Racial Wealth Gap Initiative and also the founder and principal equity consultant at Radix Consulting and the founder of the Right to Root campaign in East Portland. And then our final speaker is Antwi Ancom, who is co-founder of the Streetwise Mapping Tool, the co-founder of iSeed, and CEO and the founder, founding director of the Social Innovation Lab at University of California, San Francisco, and also um, San, Francisco. San Francisco State, yes. <laughs> So um, what we're going to do first is we're going to learn a little bit about the tools that all of these leaders have built. Each of them is going to share a few slides to talk about why they built this tool, what it does, and how people are using it for change. Then we'll have a conversation for a few minutes about the stories behind the development of these tools, and then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. So folks who are in the room, you have some index cards in front of you on your table. You can write in your questions. And then for those who are joining through the live stream, you can share your questions on Twitter using the equity data hashtag. So I am going to turn it to Sam now to share his story behind mapping police violence. Um, so, I'm Sam Sinyangwe, uh, co-founder of Campaign Zero, uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit about Mapping Police Violence. Briefly, Mapping Police Violence was launched um, in early 2015, so this was in the context of uh, the Ferguson Uprising, 
uh, and national conversation, leading to a national conversation about policing, uh, police violence, particularly against African American uh, communities. And in those early days of the conversation, there was very little data actually being used. Um, there were stories, there were uh, individual incidents that people were becoming familiar with, whether it was Mike Brown or Tamir Rice uh, or others. Um, but the federal government doesn't collect, continues not to collect comprehensive data on people killed by police in this country. Um, and so we went about, I partnered with activists on the ground in Ferguson, and together we uh, built the most comprehensive database of people killed by police in the United States and used the data uh, to help answer some of the questions uh, that people were asking about uh, how police violence is happening, how it's impacting communities, uh, and what can be done about it. So I'm gonna share a little bit about the tool. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we launched with this, um, and I'm going to see if I can play it, <laughs> hopefully. Okay, so we launched with this map. Um, it was a website, there were you know, other graphics, but this was central to it. Uh, this is a map of uh, black people killed by police in 2014. Uh, there are 320 uh, black people killed by police uh, in our database for 2014. Uh, and when we launched with this map, you know, the national conversation, uh, people were familiar with Mike Brown, they're familiar with Tamir Rice. Uh, they thought there might have been an issue going on in St. Louis or Baltimore, um, but they were not thinking that it was happening at this scale and it was happening all across the country in their own communities, in their own cities, in their own states. Uh, and so the purpose of this graphic very simply was in two seconds or less to convince people uh, that this was indeed a crisis and that something systemic was going on. Um, the, the reason we designed it this way was to be highly visual, um, to evoke a particular uh, feeling of urgency. Um, and we recognized that a lot of people were just new to this. They were seeing this on social media. They didn't have a lot of time. They weren't going to read you know, an article or a report, they were scrolling through a timeline, and we needed to show, to capture their attention in two seconds uh, and deliver the message, and so that's what this map did. Um, so from there we broke it down by place, because as we know, place matters, um, and we wanted to see for the 100 largest cities in America, uh, how, what are the rates of police violence per capita, police involved killings, uh, and how does that break down by race? Uh, and so we, looked at the 100 largest uh, cities, police departments, and we calculated the uh, police violence rates per capita. So what you see here is tw from 2013 to 2016, um, the rates per capita of police involved killings. Um, and on the site, MacMillan.org, you can scroll down and see, there are actually only three cities um, within that time period that did not kill anybody uh, of the 100 largest cities. Um, and then what we also did here, what you see on this side is, uh, these are unarmed people killed by police, um, individual cases, and we colored it by race. So what you see here is that in, in major American cities, almost everybody killed by police, uh, every, almost every unarmed person killed by police is a person of color. So red is our black people, orange is Hispanic, uh, and gray is white. Um, and you also see that the vast majority are black, right? So when we talk about unarmed people getting killed by police in cities, we're almost exclusively talking about people of color, uh, the vast majority of whom are black. And then finally, we wanted to take this information and help people uh, unpack it and understand it and use it in their activism. Uh, and so, if we go to the next slide, hopefully it's working. So then we started to look at solutions um, because you know, on the one hand, you know, understanding the problem is incredibly important, but people, after the first few months, we're like, okay, we get it, we wanna do something, what can we do about it, what should we be advocating for, what kind of policy solutions exist to address this issue? Uh, and so we looked at the policies and practices of the 100 largest city police departments, uh, their use of force policies, their civilian oversight policies, their police union contracts, training, all of that. Um, and we matched that up against the uh, likelihood that they kill civilians. And what we found was that there are particular policies that are correlated uh, with significant reductions in police-involved killings. And so here are eight that we identified. Uh, it's not the only eight, but these are uh, for use of force policies what we found. So for example, police departments that require officers to exhaust all other means before they use deadly force, basic common sense, should only be a last resort, uh, they're 25% less likely to kill people than, than departments that don't. Uh, and yet only one in three police departments actually has that as their policy. Um, similarly, policies that require officers to de-escalate situations, 15% less likely to kill people. 
um, that ban chokeholds and strangleholds, 22% less likely. Uh, and the sum total of this means departments that, imp that implement uh, all eight of these policies, controlling for other factors, including uh, arrests and crime rates, controlling for demographics, um, the police officers per capita in a population, uh, <coughs> adopting all of these policies associated with a 72% reduction uh, in police-involved killings. Uh, and so we've been working with communities across the country to be advocating for these solutions, uh, not only at the local level, but also at the state and federal level. Uh, and we've been building tools to help do that. So for example, this one allows you to put in your zip code or address. It shows you who your local, state, and federal representatives are, what votes they've taken on police reform measures, and allows you to contact them all in three clicks or less. And so we've had uh, about 90,000 people um, use this tool to actually contact the representatives and demand action. Mm -hmm. Uh, on these policies, uh, and as a consequence, we've seen many cities uh, and states adopt them and sign them into law. So I'll pass it on from there. Thank you, Sam. Julia? Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Julia. I'm a researcher with Race Forward, which is a national racial justice organization. We also um, publish colorlines.com. And I'm just going to give a short talk about <laughs> clocking in, which is um, fundamentally an education and organizing tool built for workers um, and also advocates um, that are pushing for race and gender equity within the service sector, particularly the restaurant, um, uh, retail, and domestic worker um, industries. And our main goal, our primary aim, was really to create like a highly interactive and accessible tool for those audiences. Um, and to do a couple things, uh, we're, we're a frame-based organization. We do a lot of storytelling, so we do a lot of communication strategy. And we really wanted to assert a racial justice frame around the issue of low-income service work, um, really to shift from the dominant frame around uh, these are just bad jobs um, and it's your individual fault and responsibility if you're in them to really that they are inherently valuable jobs and the reason why they are lower paid um, or don't have benefits is because they are exploited and discriminated against particularly through structural racism. Um, so we wanted to assert that frame through, through this tool and also breaking down silos of the movements that are, that are organizing across industries. And finally, just to give very practical resources um, and opportunities for workers to get plugged into campaigns and organizations who are um, organizing and advocating. Uh, so what that looks like. Um, and yeah, our thing is a little different than I think a lot of uh, others. But um, one of the main components is that we actually created an interactive game, um, or it's, it's game-like. Um, so you basically can select a character from each industry. Um, and there are, some, there are a couple different ones. Um, and these are based on focus groups and interviews that we did with workers. Um, I'll, we partnered with three organizations, which I think I'll talk about a little later, membership-based organizations in each of these industries. Um, to uh, when, you, when you select a character, you basically, it's in primi primarily built for workers, as I said. Um, you go through a series of scenarios, like up to eight rounds, in which you encounter an experience of um, structural discrimination that's really common in the industry uh, and actually make real choices um, and there are points and there are aspects to make it um, engaging where you'd want to like play through um, and the game really rewards uh, resourcing oneself as a worker um, solidarity across with with your co-workers um, and then large-scale organizing um, and no matter what choice you make, uh, the, every single round um, you're provided with either, um, there are some aspects you get provided with data, know your rights, resources, um, actual campaigns or organizations you can plug into, and like really easy ways to like sign up um, to become members of those organizations, uh, in addition to like legal resources and victories, um, like things that have actually been won and out in the world. Um, so playing through, um, and then the second major thing that we did was um, really accessible data. Um, we wanted to um, present this mainly through inter all our charts are interactive, like very colorful. Um, we like pull out key takeaways um, that are really easy to see here. Um, every 
every area, they're broken down by industry as well, um, is focused on, uh, we, we have, I mean, there are a couple different indicators that we focused on, um, what be it poverty level, um, occupational segregation, um, so on and so forth. And we also included worker voices. Um, so we did interviews with workers in the industry. Um, and so there's actual audio, we did transcription as well. Um, to make the data real um, in, in terms of stories. Um, and then we also do some interpretation in terms of like, what are you looking at? What do did, what did these different um, charts mean? And the final thing that we did is um, just targeted resources that are broken down um, by for kind of general audiences, for consumers, for workers, and they range from everything to systemic level solutions um, that are mostly put forth by those, um, by people who are organizing like in this space, who do this work every day. Uh, also, like guides for um, how workers can organize their workplaces, like short how-to guides, and for consumers, um, a number of different things, but ways to actually support campaigns and get plugged in. Um, yeah, and there are other aspects of accessibility. It's available in Spanish and English. You can use it on your mobile device or um, on your laptop. Um, yeah, there are user guides for actual organizations who want to um, incorporate it into the way that they do their orientation meetings um, or their leadership development with their members. And yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Julia. And now Nathaniel Smith with the Metro Atlanta Equity Atlas. So first let me say thank you for um, giving me an opportunity to uh, participate in such an important conversation. Um, more importantly, how do we find ways to marry the facts with action? Um, and, and that is, in my opinion, what this conversation has to boil down to. Um, and for us in Atlanta, um, it was about how do we attack the common narrative, the dominant narrative that was elevated in our city and our region that everyone was doing well in metropolitan Atlanta, that we were the home of Martin Luther King, the logistical home of the civil rights movement, that we had it all figured out. Um, but we knew that that was not necessarily the case, or not the case at all, to be completely transparent. Um, two, how can we build power in community by democratizing the data? Um, a lot of people focus on organized money and organized people, but organized information is another key pillar to building power in community. Um, so we wanted to find ways to democratize the data in a way that will help to build power um, in community. Um, and three, how could we actually use this as an opportunity um, to create an organizing agenda um, that was informed by the truth and by facts and that would empower the community to move forward in a collective way whether you were a common ally or, or an uncommon ally. So for us, it wasn't just about the data or the products associated with the Atlas. It wasn't just about the destination. It was also about the journey. And how could we use that journey as a way to elevate the voices and the experiences of the people and find ways to bring people together collectively to push an equity agenda in Metro Atlanta and beyond. So just a quick commercial, PSC, we are committed to realizing uh, a racial equity and shared prosperity agenda in the American South. Um, there are many, many ways that we do it. We can skip that slide, just quick commercial. Um, this is um, just a, a, a example of some of the maps. We have over uh, 300 maps in our atlas. We looked at um, eight different indicators. We worked with various partners around the region. We initiated a community engagement effort throughout the region first uh, to allow the community to actually play a part in developing the research questions that led to uh, the indicators that we worked with various partners to um, to research. And, and this is just a map of land pollution sites in, in Metro Atlanta and how they are disproportionately in communities of color. Um, we also, um, because it was a, a community uh, effort um, um, where we had various partners like the CDC, academic institutions, grassroots groups, and others engage, um, it was really, again, a community building effort, a, a power building effort. And, and this is actually, these are actually photos from the launch of our Atlas where we had over 300 people show up to talk about data. 
uh, because we started with the people and we wanted it to be about the people. And um, it was really a, a great day. And as you can see, uh, it, it is actually a report as well um, that is informed by uh, various leaders from around the country that are actually providing chapters that inform the GIS mapping that, that we did. So we, again, wanted to make it as accessible as possible for the community and also translate it in a way for the community where they will not be intimidated, in a way that they will not be intimidated uh, to utilize it. Another key aspect uh, of the lunch, um, and, and, and even more important after we completed the lunch, we actually began to have trainings at libraries around the region where we actually sat down and, and, and met with community stakeholders and actually trained them on how to utilize the Atlas. So it wasn't just about developing a report or, or a website, um, but we actually did a, a great deal of training in the community around it. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. And now, Kat Goganauer. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm um, here to talk a bit about a community campaign um, that's in the beginning phases here in Portland, um, the Right to Root campaign of the Community Reconstruction 3.0 initiative. Um, one of the things that we know here in Portland um, is that we are experiencing significant amounts of gentrification, um, especially in our inner city uh, where African Americans have lived historically. And so really trying to figure out how does data and a public health frame start to drive um, development without displacement. Also, how does it bolster our city's preference policy, which I think is one of the most promising practices we can kind of map onto. Um, it came out of community-led effort, and there is a desire by the city to have people relocate back to the urban core. Uh, my community's been displaced about 20 miles west um, in an area that our community has never been in. Due to redlining and segregation in, in North Portland, the heart of our community is called the Albina District. And so really trying to figure out how to use the health outcomes that are impacting our community, especially root shock, um, and different um, traumatic kind of processes that Mindy Fuller Love have, has said uh, impact people's ability to respond to opportunity or threat. I find that very compelling if they, we have a lot of um, resources coming into the area, but people have lost their emotional and social ecosystems by virtue of being displaced. Um, how do we start to change the narrative? To Nathaniel's point, um, African American community uh, occupies an interesting place in the imagination of the nation. Um, and so are we actually able to be the architects and owners of our community, or are we um, supposed to be reliant on external service providers and people who speak on our behalf, often not with us? So in um, 2015, um, I started working um, to use a lot of the data I have found to try to make the case and shift the narrative and also do a bit of cultural reclamation um, to move from a deficiency frame to an asset and strengths based frame that says our community is already resilient and has withstood many, many decades of displacement here in Oregon. Uh, we're unique in Oregon in that we're the only state who came into the union with an exclusion, a racial exclusion clause in our constitution that forbade African Americans and other people of color from owning land or entering into contracts until the 30s. Um, we also had only about 2,000 African Americans in the state of Oregon due to this um, this clause until the shipbuilding effort of World War II, where 20,000 African Americans, as well as a significant amount of other people, um, came but were located in Vanport. Um, and so the middle slide, let me start quickly with the first slide is the, the Hulk map, the Home Ownership Loan Corporation map, the redlining map. Um, and really, here it was different. These maps were put out in the 30s. However, our community was located into redlined areas that were created for Eastern European communities. You know, it, back then, certain people were not perceived as white still. And so our community was moved into this area after the Vanport flood of 1948 that wiped out all of the shipbuilding housing. The Smithsonian has recently written about the removal of the second largest city in the nation in a day and speaks about African Americans as refugees, which I think is really interesting from an international perspective. How do we talk about internally displaced persons um, and how this kind of process of finding neighborhoods um, is displacing folks who've been here. 
The third map on the top shows that we have a disproportionate rent increase in North Portland. Um, it's higher, I think it's 71% between 2011 and 2015. Our, um, our square footage is more expensive than other affluent areas in Portland. So there's something special happening. Um, and these bottom maps are showing that from 1970 until 2010, this is the, the concentration and removal pattern of African Americans. The darker spaces um, show the concentration of our community. Um, in 2010, it shows uh, the kind of dilution of our community. The thing that was important in that was in 2000, in 2000, our city created the urban renewal area known as ICURA, the Interstate Corridor Urban Renewal Area, the largest urban renewal area in the state of Oregon that encompasses all 10 of the highest concentration uh, African-American neighborhoods. Um, and there are many plans and reports that kind of said gentrification might happen. So really wondering how do we mitigate and redress now that we're well in. Outcomes driven for me is, is the issue and the promise of health equity. Um, so when I look at the data of these policies and I see 48.6% of black kids in Oregon are suffering from hunger, um, I see 48% uh, increase in homelessness between 2013 and 15 um, due to no cause evictions. We have a ban on rent control. We also don't have inclusionary zoning as a tool um, fully in operation yet in the state of Oregon. Um, our annual median income, even after this increase economically, is 27000 The median of North Portland is now about $60,000. So why weren't we able to take advantage of this opportunity, I wonder? Um, we are not 6.3% of, of the statewide population. That's of the city of Portland. We're only 2% of the entire state. 28% um, of our families experience intimate partner and domestic violence. They propose three people a day, three black people a day are being removed from our neighborhood and that's equated to 10,000 um, between 2000 and 2010. By 2020, we'll be able to see um, what that impact has been and bear in mind, we only have about 70, 80,000 black people in the whole state of Oregon. Um, in 2000, uh, we only own 4,199 homes. Um, we were hit very hard by the housing crisis and then Multnomah County proposes that people lose about seven years of their lives based on chronic stress and from poverty and displacement. So really my question is how do we solve some of this with these tools? Um, I think I'm at time, so I'll talk more about the solution and the unique partnerships we've been able to create as a grassroots uh, community funded campaign um, that's really trying to use economic development as a way to borrow from Dr. O'Comb to innovate out of poverty. Thank you. What a great transition to Antoyan Combe, streetwise. We're, hi. <laughs> We're waiting for our technology to catch up to us. <laughs> so we'll just pause momentarily. There we go. So, um, good afternoon and buenas tardes, everybody. Um, my name is Antwia Combe, and that is Ekta Shah. Uh, we're the co-founders of Streetwise. Um, we start in two languages, really intentionally, um, because we've built a platform that's multilingual. And we think it's really important to have multilingual platforms when you're trying to reach the fastest growing uh, populations in the United States slash world. Um, the real challenge that we tackled when we got into this work is, you know, how do you reimagine and redesign our cities for communities that have been locked out of sustainability conversations, locked out of shareable city conversations, locked out of smart city conversations, and locked out of social justice conversations? Will we be redesigning and reimagining our cities for rich people or for poor people, for people of color or for white folks? for eco-haves or eco-have-nots, and who will have a say in how we redesign our cities? Will it be powerful elites, or will it be everyday people? And to us, if you want to create a healthtopia, a greentopia, health equity, whatever you want to call it, not for the 1%, but with the 100%, then it's not enough to ask, how can we build healthier communities? How can we build happier 
communities? How can we build greener communities without first addressing these real gaps in terms of the gaps in invisibility, in terms of the invisibility of data, in terms of what we know and when and how we find out that data without addressing the gaps in inequality that is closing the gaps between data rich communities and data poor communities and disrupting the false binary that some communities are data rich while others are data poor and really showing how real time data on structural racialization impacts access to opportunity for our nation's most vulnerable populations. And so to us, we have not correctly identified the problem. We think that HUD and the EPA and the US Green Building Council and Eco Districts, who I love and I'm on the board of Eco Districts, the equity atlases that are out there, Green Star and other certification rating systems, on the left hand side, we think that they've done a brilliant job of setting top down ambitious goals for the design of the built environment. And we refer to that as the hardware. But what we think is missing on the right hand side is our collective lived experience. What we know to be happening on the ground and in the street, right, at the street level. What we refer to as the software. And so we think the real challenge of the 21st century data revolution is how do you integrate official knowledge, which is the hardware, right, big data, and everybody assumes big data is correct, with local knowledge, which is the software, in ways that make data more valid and reliable, authentic and meaningful from the perspective of everyday people. And so our way of doing this, we think the missing link is really equity, data equity, and people-powered placemaking. And I think Sarah said it's really not about the technology. It's as much about the people as it is about the technology, and we need to shift from having people that are data consumers to having low-income communities and communities of color become data producers through real-time data and two-way feedback loops that allow people to transform the social material conditions happening in their neighborhood. Our way of accomplishing this goal is by building a platform that we call Streetwise. Streetwise is a mobile mapping and SMS platform that collects real-time data about how people are experiencing cities and services and turns that into actionable analytics. For example, we have great geospatial information on you all live near a park. But what we really want to know is what is your experience in that park? Is that the park where the drugs are sold? Is it safe enough to bring my children to the park? Do the swing sets even work at the park? Streetwise allows you to collect both proximal data and experiential data and you can toggle between those two as you wish. And in doing so, we address these two key questions about how do you democratize data and how do you democratize decision making. <clears throat> Part of what we're up to is we are now in partnership with enterprise community partners. They are the largest nonprofit affordable housing provider in the country. They are building out a communities of opportunity index for housing powered in part by Streetwise. Streetwise will be providing real-time data on housing. We're helping them build out an evidence-based assessment framework, making it open source, and building a community engagement partnership toolkit. A Couple more slides here for you. Streetwise addresses questions that are happening beneath the regulatory radar. So there's all kinds of data out there that the equity atlases are missing, right, that are happening on the ground level around how walkable is a neighborhood. How well is a neighborhood served by public transit? Where do I go if there's an emergency? What are the issues that people really care about in my neighborhood? And we're gonna take you through one example of how folks are using Streetwise in East Oakland. What you're looking at right now is a data set from Open Oakland. This is the data set that the mayor would see, that you all would see if you went to Open Oakland. And the purple dots represent the number of supposed grocery stores that are in East Oakland. And as you can see, East Oakland looks like a veritable food oasis. But when you ground truth that data with Streetwise, you find out that those aren't really grocery stores. Only a handful are grocery stores, and the majority are liquor stores or corner stores. You can also upload pictures and audio and video 
which is critically important when you're dealing with low literacy or lower literacy populations. Finally, we've, we've incorporated the ability to tell your own story, right? And we believe in the power of social media when you're trying to build power and self-determination in your community. So we're gonna briefly allow a young woman to narrate her experience of living in a food desert for you all. Okay, so what are you, let's see, um, what are you looking at? How was it when you went inside? It was dirty when I went inside and I would never eat anything in there. Do you consider this to be a grocery store? Hell no. Why? Because it's, they don't sell any groceries and it's just a bunch of junk food in there. And I mean, they have little sandwiches, but I would never eat that cause, because it's dirty. And then all the fruit is all like old, like wrinkly and looks old. And then all the like meat that they did have, like the bacon and all that and the whole thing, looks like it's been sitting in there for about a year or something like that. I wouldn't call it a grocery store at all. So, hell no, I wouldn't eat there. So right away you can get a sense of what is happening in that East Oakland community when you hear from the people who are actually living in the community. We also know key performance indicators are really important, so these are key performance indicators that Eco Districts is using and we're using in our partnership with Eco Districts. In terms of our success, in the upper right hand corner, the Atlantic City Lab is named Streetwise as one of the 12 new data tools to help vulnerable populations climb the economic ladder. Green Biz in the middle, named Streetwise as one of the few platforms to measure different kinds of resiliency, social resiliency, cultural resiliency, urban resiliency, climate resiliency. And uh, the chief data scientist from the Obama administration wrote a great note thanking Streetwise, bottom right hand corner, for everything we're doing to make cities work for 100% of the people. In terms of the food access article, the policy went out of that was that there's a farmer's market that came to that neighborhood. There, we were able to go back to those liquor stores and actually transform many of those liquor stores and put in more culturally appropriate food. And there was a $455 million food commissary built for that particular community. I'm gonna pause here so you can give that a hand. Yeah. And then in closing, I th we recently uh, wrote an article in City Watch LA around how the Trump administration is moving to not only gag the EPA, but they're changing the focus of HUD and others to no longer collect racial and ethnic disparity data. And what does that really mean for the great work that others have shown today in this room, for all of us in this room, is that local data is now more important than ever. And in terms of our current partnerships and projects, We've partnered with the White House Opportunity Project. We're currently partnering with PolicyLink and CSI on equity impact assessments in Oakland. We are partnering with Spark, Strong Prosperous Resilient Communities, are launching projects around the country. We're a platform provider for 100 resilient cities, and I've already mentioned eco districts. In terms of you all and possible collaborations with everybody on this panel and in this room, can you imagine using Streetwise to help produce community-driven maps of hate incidences, right? And so we've been in conversation with some folks at the White House. There's very little data. This is Sam's work, right, around hate incidences, right? Not just in relationship to police, but the growing amount of hate incidences since the Trump administration. Or imagine that we could partner with many of the equity atlases in this room around opportunity data, ground truth with streetwise local data. I think that's a real opportunity for partnership and collaboration. And then finally, imagine growing the right to root Kat's work and Schweta's work around gentrification and displacement. We invite all of you to join us in building a new data revolution that begins to integrate local knowledge with official knowledge to build communities that are equitable all. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. What amazing, amazing tools, amazing work that you all are doing. So we'll have a few minutes to talk about, talk a little bit more about your tools. Um, and then for folks in the room and online, if you want to share questions for the Q&A section, you can do that. You can write them on the index cards or, or share them via Twitter. 
um, with equity data hashtag. So to start, um, I heard a lot about the intentionality, what that went into all of your tools and developing them. So I wanted to start out with asking Julia to share a little bit more about how they went about developing, clocking in, and the process of engaging with workers that were represented in the tool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I first just want to say, because in the introduction, um, I'm not the creator of the tool, it was co-created. Um, Natalie Ortega and Julia Moneros, Dominic Apollon, I want to, and Ankita Mohanty, I want to raise those people up. Um, yeah, we started, f the first thing that we did was reach out to organizations that we had had long-term relationships with, certainly, or who were just recognized as having incredible um, organizing power and ethics and being like deeply within um, and of uh, communities of color or workers of color who, who are in these industries. So we partnered with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the um, Retail Action Project and the Restaurant Opportunity Center was our first um, uh, part of a, the partnership that we made um, and then engaged in like a series of conversations around what would be most useful for your workers really to do two things um, either to uh, recruit uh, workers who were not at that point organized um, and doing organizing work within their industries or to help um, develop the leadership and the capacity of worker leaders um, in those industries. And um, it was actually partially, you know, their idea that around a potential game, something that could be used in the structure of how they um, work together with workers or organized workers um, in their organization and also something that they could do as an outreach tool. Um, uh, the second kind of component was we did um, you know, what are called focus groups, but really like deep conversations with workers around the country to get some real clarity around um, common practices of discrimination and exploitation that happen in those industries um, from workers themselves that could really um, make the, the experience of the game very real and, and super um, relatable. Uh, so we, we had um, conversations and actually got a lot of feedback um, in partnership with those organizations and with those members that that was a very, um, uh, not only cathartic, but powerful experience to be talking specifically about race and gender um, discrimination and exploitation um, together as a group and then ways in which, in which people um, actually do work daily to, to try to thwart that, to try to organize against that. Um, and, and to list, lift up victories and, and resources and so on and so forth that have been helpful. Um, and we also did a number of um, interviews with, with workers who wanted to have their voices like and their faces out there um, and, um, and on the site. Uh, and then we worked on the back end uh, once the site, once we had built up like a number of different prototypes of it, testing it, where can it, um, where can it be shifted, what needs to um, change to make it actually useful um, and got a lot of feedback like from the National Domestic Workers Alliance that were like, we cannot use this tool if it's not in Spanish, you know, we just can't. Um, so went through and, you know, went back to our funder and we we're like, we need more money to build it out in, in Spanish, like, in, you know, like to the ability to negotiate and, and just be like, we can't, we can't finish this process if unless it's useful. Um, and then worked a lot with organizations on the back end to um, around uh, deeper understanding about how they function on the day to day uh, to and creating like a user guide and and how would you imagine incorporating this um, into your organization's work uh, and and wanting to make really accessible kind of um, ancillary products to hold it uh, so we yes yeah, so we did that as well um, yeah so it's really from front to back and um, and I think it was lifted up earlier in the day, but um, the need really to, to advocate on the front end, to have enough resources um, for help, for making sure that organizations who are super low capacity, um, like I think we all are, like strapped, to make sure that it can be carried out for a long, sustainable time um, in terms of outreach and engagement, and that's like not often a part of like the grant world or so on and so forth. So that's something that to be pushing on the on the um, kind of financing end um, and the capacity end, and being real about uh, it's you can't just produce the product, right? We have to be able to um, engage and support organizations to be able to to utilize it too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I actually want to come back to that in a minute. Um, what are the real challenges to creating equity data tools? But I wanted to turn to Sam actually to talk about his experience. It's not every day that a policy wonk you know, leaves his day job. Um, Sam was working with me at PolicyLink and then left to create Mapping Police Violence and really was working directly with activists. And so I would like you to share how your engagement and partnership with activists influenced your, your tool and how you developed it. Yeah, so, um, you know, as Sarah said, you know, I was at PolicyLink and, you know, this national movement started and I saw an opportunity to add value to that conversation and to advance equity within it using data um, and you know the connection really happened through Twitter so you know the Twitter has been the digital infrastructure behind the Black Lives Matter movement um, and I literally connected to uh, protest leaders on the ground in Ferguson through Twitter I didn't know them I didn't hadn't met them, but I replied to a tweet um, that asked for help and said, you know, I can help create uh, a data tool that can help answer some of the questions um, and, and add value to this conversation. Um, the person who I contacted, uh, Duray McKesson, sent me his phone number. We got on the phone that day and the next day and the day after that, and those conversations uh, led to the development of this tool. Uh, in terms of how that collaboration worked, uh, you know, we created a couple things. So one, we work back and forth with the people on the ground leading the protests in Ferguson, but also created a, a WhatsApp chat with protest leaders across the country who were doing similar work. Uh, and that was sort of our focus group, if you will. So we would, everything that we did, we wanted to make sure that it was done in partnership with and was you know, sort of signed off on by the folks who were leading the work, who were doing the advocacy on the ground locally in their communities. Um, and so that's what led to the design of the site. Um, there were many different drafts that went back and forth, and at the end of the day, we settled on something that um, was very clear that centered black people um, and, and the impact on black communities in a way that uh, none of the other sort of data tools that have since been created on police violence have done. Um, and that was very accessible to people who uh, may have been new to politics, who were younger, uh, who were accessing this through mobile devices, who had two seconds or three seconds to understand a concept who may not have had um, you know, a very high level of literacy, so needed to see things visually um, and made it shareable. Um, so we also partnered with folks who had been directly impacted by police violence. So each of the incidents in our database um, is not only taken from you know, police reports and media reports, um, but many of them are also uh, taken from community narratives, from families that have been impacted, um, that have sent us information about um, what happened so that we can add that to the individual cases. So when people you know, on that map, um, it's not just a map, you can click on each individual incident and it pulls up uh, a summary of what happened uh, and those summaries incorporate those stories. Um, so s the whole effort was done in collaboration with the folks who were on the ground leading the work. Um, and done in a way that I think was true to the spirit of the movement, centering black folks and black lives um, and centering equity from the start. Uh, and that's been our approach since. Thank you, wow. Um, Kat, actually I had a question for you, which is I think the issue that you're working on around gentrification and displacement, especially of the black population from Portland is, you know, it's occurring in many, many cities. And so how do you, reach people once they've been displaced or how are you dealing with that challenge of people who are missing and who are far away? So that's a really good question and I think um, a lot of my desire to do this process came out of the, the lack of query about where the people have gone um, and really understanding that people are still around. Um, perhaps they're not being uh, engaged in the right ways because they're in places where we've never lived before. And you know, one of the things about lumping people together as people of color or whatever, we're often not aware or lifting up or understanding what excludes black people specifically. And so um, while you can look out at East County and it's very diverse, um, there aren't a lot of places. Our institutions are still in North Portland. So I had um, 
the, the luck of working at Self Enhancement Incorporated, which is the largest African American nonprofit in the state of Oregon, um, focusing on youth education. We have um, the inverse of the of the state. I think 80 to 90 percent of our staff are black, and you know the other 10 percent makes up the other uh, other groups. Um, and so I was able to do what I did through networking at my job. Also, I was strategic manager on something called the African American Financial Capabilities Initiative, which is a national initiative to bring together um, communities, black communities of practice and local geographies to deal with asset and wealth inequality. Um, it's the work I'm continuing to do with the racial wealth, wealth divide at a slightly different level. Um, but also from um, being a community health worker, I'm very embedded in the community. And you know, one of the things I probably didn't reveal is, you know, I am the people that I'm talking about as well. My family lost our house in 2010 after moving up here um, and living in a house for 10 years, um, being affected by the housing crisis. And so, you know, I think I'm able to have different kinds of conversations with people who might not normally want to share um, how they're being impacted. Also, because I come at it from a strengths-based perspective, I'm never assuming people just weren't smart enough and sold their houses for money, which is, I just um, heard this again the other day, someone new to Portland said, well, didn't your community make this, this happen? And, you know, being able to draw upon um, policy um, and say, you know, these were actually the decisions at the local, regional, state level, um, you know, that have caused this kind of uh, consequence. It's a different way of engaging. And so um, we did focus groups for two years. We did community meetings um, at these safe spaces, our in cultural institutions. Um, we also then brought in um, external potential partners in a design charrette, so really started to think about what does our community look like if black people were to build it. Um, so really trying to move it out of this other dynamic where we're the victims of a process and we probably can't figure out what we would do if it wasn't happening. I'm um, to say we already have a vision for ourselves and, and from that, um, ICEED um, became a fiscal sponsor for us because one of the architecture firms offered us a significant amount of te technical assistance to start to draft up a report, which is what we'll be launching soon, the Right to Root report of the Community Reconstruction 3.0 initiative. Black people are gonna try a third time to build a community. Um, but really thinking about what are the root causes, what things um, are interconnected. For me, I'm, you know, my mom says we're basically lazy. I just wanna figure out the one thing that can solve these issues. So. For me, it's poverty. And if we were able to have multiple ways that we're tackling poverty, especially understanding that it causes so much chronic stress, which then drives health inequities, um, also precludes us from purchasing our basic needs like food. You know, It's really hard to learn when you're hungry. It's really hard to work when you're hungry. So how do we use public health to a different effect? Um, and the beautiful thing about public health, Dr. Kamara Jones has really talked about institutionalized racism and the medical fields responsibility to underserved communities, to become advocates and really talk about how our policies are harming people in ways that we can ch shift. The, the last piece is, you know, we're in conversation with Streetwise trying to figure out what a data collection tool looks like. Um, we need to capacitate our community for the, you know, foreseeable future. We have a very interesting political dynamic here. So, you know, who gets to, to kind of harvest the stories to what somebody said earlier? Um, who uses those and to what effect? And what difference would it make if our black people were able to tell our stories, um, to aggregate our data, and to really push our own policy agenda? So we're hoping by 2018 to be able to roll out something with a really good data collection piece so that we're ensuring that this could become a best practice. Yeah, I think that the theme is very resonant around narrative and community voice and how do you create that narrative from the people who are most impacted. Um, going back to the, I don't know if there's questions that are coming in from the live stream or if somebody's capturing that, um, you could hand me index cards or if folks in the room have them, just hand them to me, otherwise I'll keep going. Um, but I wanted to ask you all about what you see as um, the challenges in creating data tools like yours for the field and thinking about if you are speaking to funders, investors, you know, what should be happening to create more tools like yours and to support your tools and taking them to scale? More money. <laughs> I think, I think the, the challenge with uh, developing especially localized atlases is the, the just the amount of dollars 
and investments that is required, not just monetarily, but also in terms of sweat equity um, to, to get atlases off the ground. I mean, we, we had an opportunity to partner uh, with three universities who assisted us, uh, Mercer, Emory, and Georgia Tech. We also had the Federal Reserve engaged and other partners, the CDC and other people in, in, involved. But most frontline organizations at the time don't have those relationships. Um, and so again, you know, when we talk about data, what we're, what we're really talking about is, is power, um, um, organized power. Um, and, and the power to address uh, a, a narrative that may not necessarily be consistent with the, 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 the set of values that are required to create good policy. Um, you know, public policy in itself is just a reflection of the values of people in power. Um, so, so that challenge around how do we accumulate the resources um, to develop a tool that will attack the current value system um, that we're trying to address um, in a way that will realize policy that is by and for the people um, requires a great deal of resources um, and also the ability to connect uh, with uh, friends that may not necessarily understand your goals and, and have the ability to support that in some way, academic anchor institutions and other groups to get out there and connect to those um, partners may, are difficult as well for, for smaller organizations. I mean, there was a time just at, at a point where partnership with Southern Equity, we were moving forward on the Atlas, you know, the actual budget for the Atlas was actually more than our operational budget. And, 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 and for many organizations, that is a problem if you're, if you're really working to try to move uh, something like this forward. So, so I would say the relationships question, the resource question in terms of sweat equity and money, um, minimize the opportunity for more atlases to, to be created. And then the second piece is really around how do you update it? You know, so you get it done, you, you develop the, 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 you know, the, the tool, you have a big party, people start using it, but you know, data is constantly changing, information is constantly changing and shifting. And if you don't have the capacity to constantly update that data, then the atlas has become old quickly. Um, so from, from our perspective, those are just some challenges that we had. Yeah, definitely. With our experience with the National Equity Atlas is we need to update it every year, which means Pamela and Justin at Peer <laughs> for a month updating the data and funders don't really want to fund it as infrastructure. They want new things, so that's definitely a challenge. Others um, ha have anything to add to that? Sure, mm -hmm. I'll add. Mm -hmm. So I think um, Streetwise, Streetwise is definitely partnering with you, I thought in 2018, so you said we were in conversation, but I think we're definitely gonna do something with CAT. Um, I think in terms of the updating, that's why we built Streetwise. It's real-time data, right? So th that's exactly what I was saying about the opportunity, but I wanna underscore that opportunity just so we're, we're all moving forward together. Um, this particular platform gets right at the heart of the updating issue. Right, with real-time updates from everyday people. Um, I, think, I think to funders, I think the new Jim Crow, the new, new Jim Crow, right? Um, moving beyond Michelle Alexander's amazing work um, about incarceration, and I am a formerly incarcerated person. My civil rights violated unjustly, like so many other folks. Uh, but I think the new, new Jim Crow is also about the gaps in access to opportunity around Silicon Valley and technology for uh, black folks, other people of color, and for women. And I think that uh, we don't talk about it enough in terms of who, acts, who gets access to what. I think funders need to be, I think funders are moving entirely too slow when it comes to the realm of technology. I think technology moves at faster than the speed of light, and I think funders are, haven't seen the power of local data, the power of people telling their own story. Um, 
the power of integrating these data with bigger data sets and um, how that can totally transform and prioritize public investment. Um, and so I think that's a message that we really want to send to funders is to be forward thinking to all of the great work that, that has been showcased today. Then I think the other thing, the final thing I will say is around procurement. And I think um, folks have to be way more, in equity conversations have to be way more intentional about procurement. I think we are one of maybe five or 10 max, but y'all can correct me if I'm wrong or we'll figure out the real data, uh, black owned technology companies, black and women led technology companies that are focusing on local data, right? There's like a handful in the country and we should all be intentional with or without funders about working together. Right, if we're serious about equity, and we're serious about equity because we all showed up here, right? So we should all be figuring out beyond funders how to work with each other, right? And leverage the resources that we do have. Um, so that's what I have to add to that conversation. All right, thank you so much to all of you. What an amazing discussion. And we are gonna continue to talk about design principles for equity data tools and that information that we talk about with those folks in the room um, is going to go into a report that we will release to the field. So we're going to share and continue to discuss how we can evolve this movement. So thank you all. Let's give everyone a round of applause.